Good afternoon. Welcome to the ninth and last press conference of this 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm AAS Press Officer Rick Feinberg. We're webcasting today and monitoring the webcast is AAS Media Fellow Tharani Conchati in the back of the room. If you are on the webcast and you have questions for after the briefing, please use the text chat to queue up your questions. Uh, would everybody please make sure that your cell phones or other beeping and chiming and ringing things are, are silenced. Uh, there will not be any press releases going out in conjunction with this briefing, so don't be hunting through your inbox for them. In case this is your first AAS press conference, the way we do it here is I will introduce all the speakers and then they'll give their presentations one after the other in order, and then when they're finished, we'll have the Q&A. We usually start here in the room and then go to the webcast for that. So as the AAS press officer, I often receive phone calls from the media asking for comment from the astronomical community on this or that. And this year, or I should say last year, 2019, um, and certainly already beginning this year, uh, the topic that's been come up, coming up the most has been satellite constellations and their effect on astronomy. This all kind of hit, hit the airwaves last spring uh, when SpaceX launched the first of their uh, Starlink satellites. And it's interesting because I had heard about the launch, um, but I didn't really think about it much. And I happened to be observing that night from my field out in New Hampshire. And I looked up and I saw this remarkable train of you know, dozens of satellites going overhead. And if I hadn't heard about the Starlink launch, I would have been really mystified. And in fact, the last media call I had, which was this morning, was from a reporter in Florida, I think, who wanted to know what astronomers think of this mysterious uptick in UFO sightings. <laughs> and I said, well, there's a simple explanation. So I actually wasn't planning to have a press briefing on this topic, but enough reporters asked me about it that I thought, you know, we should do it. We should do it. So there was a session this morning, um, and uh, participating in that session was a representative from SpaceX. Uh, and I invited her to join the panel too, but uh, she didn't want to. So that's too bad. Um, but the people who are on the panel today uh, have been in touch with SpaceX. They're uh, part of the AAS's effort to, to try to get a handle on what's going on with these satellites and how to uh, minimize their impact on astronomy. So we're going to hear from four people today. Uh, the first is, uh, on the left, is Jeff Hall. He's the director of Lowell Observatory out in Flagstaff, Arizona. He's going to introduce the topic, talk about, you know, Starlink and, and these um, satellite constellations and their effect on astronomy. Um, then we're going to hear three um, perspectives on different uh, different audiences or different ways in which these effects manifest themselves. Patrick Seitzer from the University of Michigan will talk about their effect on optical astronomy. And Ruskin Hartley, the new director of the International Dark Sky Association, will talk about their impact on the general public, those of us who just look up and enjoy the sky. And then Harvey List from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory will talk about their effect on radio astronomy. So we're going to hear, um, you know, multifaceted presentations on why astronomers are concerned about these things. So with that, I will turn it over to Jeff, and we shall get started. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, probably most or all of you have seen this image. Um, this was captured uh, last May at Lowell Observatory. Uh, made quite the rounds in, in the press and in the social media. Uh, this was not taken with one of our research telescopes, but in fact on one of our evening uh, public viewings for the public with a general purpose telescope. And it shows the Starlink trails clearly going through the image about three days after launch. Uh, what caught everyone principally by surprise was the sheer brightness of, of the, the, quote, string of pearls going across the sky. I think the astronomical community was quite surprised by this. SpaceX, by their own admission, was also surprised. Given that currently, pre-Starlink, 
there, of all the things up there, there are about 200 that are visible at one time or another to the naked eye. Um, when you combine an image like this with the potential for 42,000 satellites from Starlink times several other American or international operators possibly having similar designs, uh, you can understand why this got everyone's attention and there was a very strong initial reaction. Um, since then, the AAS commissioned the uh, Committee on Light Pollution, Radio Interference, and Space Debris to work with SpaceX, who reached out uh, very proactively to, to discuss the matter with us. <clears throat> so in a nutshell, what has transpired since last May? Uh, we have had eight uh, telecons with representatives from SpaceX, both their uh, public relations folks as well as engineers working on the Starlink project. Uh, mostly these conversations have been to initiate a dialogue to begin to understand what we think the impacts will be of the full Constellation build-out. Um, uh, Pat Seitzer, in a moment, will give you uh, more of the, the technical details that have emerged that, but in the early stages, we're really trying to understand, you know, is this, uh, at, to what level is this a nuisance, to what level is this an existential threat to ground-based astronomy in whatever uh, area of inquiry that might be, optical, IR, radio. Um, uh, as Rick mentioned, we've had in-person meetings with SpaceX uh, here at the meeting, had very productive discussions, and they contributed to our session this morning. Um, our committee has attempted to uh, think about targets that satellite operators might need to hit in order to solve the impacts on astronomy, but we don't want to think for the entire astronomical community, so we have sent out a, a survey to collect uh, input and feedback from a variety of, of observatories and interests in research astronomy. And as you probably know, the, the launch from just a few days ago includes a darkened uh, satellite, so we can see whatever they did, uh, see, see what the effect of that is. Um, one thing I can confidently tell you is this is a first dip of the toe into the water. This will not solve the problem, it will not mitigate it. It's a first attempt to test one thing and see what the effect is. And, and we will simply proceed uh, with SpaceX as we go forward through the launches in 2020. Now, um, uh, Pat and, and, and Harvey will give you some of the technical details of the potential impacts and, and the results of our modeling uh, for optical and radio astronomy. I think it's fair for me to conclude, maybe with some observations about why we are concerned about uh, preserving the nighttime sky for astronomical research uh, in the first place. So many of you, or most of you, all of you, have probably seen, uh, know this image very well as well. This is the Hubble ultra deep field. It's a patch of sky, just a tiny fraction, the size of the full moon. In it we find thousands of galaxies and we're looking back here virtually to the beginning of time. And here we all are this week, 3,400 astronomers and guests, students, exhibitors, uh, staff, uh, these sort of amazing collections of self-aware atoms all collected together, uh, pondering our very origins and pondering the phenomena that created the very atoms that we're made of a long time ago and far, far away. Obtaining our place and understanding our place in the cosmos inspires us, it grounds us, and it helps keep us civilized. Now, um, that's one thing. But the other dimension to this is um, this incredible collection of atoms. About a century ago, a group of physicists devoted more or less their entire careers to understanding or trying to understand the nature of the atom and the behavior of the universe as they were observing it at the atomic level. What they discovered was counterintuitive, arcane, and honestly, a little bit weird. And yet those discoveries through the decades since have transformed every aspect of our society, including among many other things, the uh, electronic computing devices that pervade our existence today. One of those physicists was Albert Einstein and it was his ponderings about the interlocked nature of space and time that are the reason we can use our little handheld computers to navigate accurately through Honolulu or wherever we happen to be. When we understand 
the universe and expand our understanding of the universe, it rewards us on multiple levels, and it is worth preserving. Now, SpaceX has stated its goals of audacious exploration and betterment of humanity. Exactly the same can be said of astronomy, because that's what we do, and it is worth preserving. I think the challenge of solving the issue of satellite mega constellations for astronomy will be difficult, uh, but neither astronomers nor aerospace engineers are any strangers to difficult problems. And I was very grateful to hear our SpaceX colleagues here at the AAS meeting this week state that they are committed to solving the problem working collaboratively with astronomy. I look forward to seeing that happen. So let's do it. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Pat Seitzer. I'm an observational astronomer from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And actually for the last 20 years, my, my research specialty has been optically surveying for space debris. And uh, thus I bring a particular set of skills to this. Um, why are we concerned about the new mega constellation since there are so many tens of thousands of objects already in orbit? They're bright. The new satellites could be brighter than 99% of all of the objects in orbit today, be it space debris, be it rocket bodies, uh, be it active satellites, dead satellites, you know, aluminum panels, whatnot. So as Jeff pointed out, there's maybe 200 objects that you can, 200 objects in Earth orbit that you can see with the eye, not all at once right now, um, and that are brighter than say sixth magnitude. That does not include the 180 objects that Starlink, that SpaceX has already launched in the last eight months. So by the end of 2020, SpaceX will add another 1,584. So basically you're gonna see an increase in the number of satellites that you can see with your unaided eye by a factor of nine. Uh, in less than one year by one operator. So that's our concerns. Um, it really is that the new satellites are brighter than 99% of all the objects in orbit right now. So let me just give you an example of what the effect on astronomy is. Um, so this is an image taken with a dark energy camera in uh, Chile on the 4-meter Blanco telescope, a camera used, for co used and built for cosmology. And um, this was an image that was taken in July and shows a satellite trail crossing uh, the field of view. Well, that doesn't look too bad, does it? Except that that streak saturated the detector, okay? So you had loss of information in the pixels. You had crosstalk in the electronics. If you looked very, very faintly, you could see that there was a mirror image of that streak running through here, which um, was due to crosstalk in the electronics. Um, you can have ghost images out of focus elsewhere in the field of view, and you can have possible residual images in, in upcoming uh, images. So that's why astronomers are so very seriously concerned about this, that even if these objects are not visible to the unaided eye, they could still saturate our telescope's detectors. So even if they're not visible to the eye, they could still cause problems for professional astronomers using wide field surveys. So our conclusions on all of this are that mega constellations at LEO are coming, and they're coming fast. Uh, SpaceX initial deployment of 1,584 will be done by the end of this year. The new satellites are brighter than 99% of the current objects in orbit. Now the good news, of that 1,584, you only see a small fraction above you at any one time, typically six to nine above 30 degrees elevation. And the string of pearls that got everybody so excited about, these strings of bright satellites that are clustered together, are probably not a good representation of the final operational state. So that's the good news. 
If the 1584 Starlynx was the only constellation to be launched, astronomers could handle it, okay? If these 1584 by SpaceX, six to nine visible above, your, above you at any one time, we could handle that. But could, there are plans or press releases sent out for 10 or, 10, 10 or 20 times that. It's just the start. So, and we have a very short time to deal with this issue. The project that is most likely to be affected is the LSST and SpaceX. Uh, the survey is the most impacted by bright, survey, by bright satellite trails because of its wide field of view and extreme sensitivity. The original Starlinks will saturate the LSST detectors. And this is a statement was provided to me by Tony Tyson, the LSST chief scientist, and you have his email there at the bottom. Fortunately, there's a joint LSST SpaceX engineering teams working to change this, how to make the satellites fainter, changes to the LSST readout to avoid artifacts, and changes to scheduling to avoid bright satellites. And in, these are Tony's words, we find that SpaceX is committed to solving this problem. So that's the very good news. Um, the final thoughts on Starlinks. At an operational orbit of 550 kilometers, they will be visible to the unaided eye under very good conditions, fifth magnitude. You probably won't see them from a city. Any sort of, a, of effort to reduce the brightness will make them invisible to the unaided eye. Any sort of effort there. If you can knock it down a factor of five, you'll never see them, even if you're 17 years old and on top of a mountain in Chile. The string of pearls that gets everybody's attention at the parking checkout deployment orbits at 350 kilometers will be increasingly common. <coughs> so do not be surprised when you see two, three, four, five such strings available over the next year as they are deployed. And that the good news on this is that they're visible not too far into the darkest part of the night. But do not be surprised if two, three, four, five, maybe even six such strings are visible in the night sky at any one time. They are not representative of what they will be at 550 and fifth magnitude. So thank you for your time. Keep hitting the bus big button that says refresh. No, it's not. Oh, it's not coming up. Let's try that. There we go. Not just me then. No, it's not just you. <laughs> Thank you. So if we were having this conversation a year ago, I think what we would have been talking about is ground-based light pollution. And I wanted to set this conversation today in that, in that context. And just as a short reminder for everyone, it might be old news to people, but basically 80% of people in the world live under a polluted sky, a light polluted sky. In fact, the rate of increase of light pollution is about, we estimate globally, is 2% a year. Some places it's zero, some places it's much faster than that. So that's the context and the background in which that we're considering this new evolving emerging threat of light pollution. Now, on the positive side, I'm having difficulty with this. Awareness and action of tackling light pollution is growing. Um, at, the international, at the International Dark Sky Association, we see evidence of this every day, and in particular, I wanna talk just very briefly about our International Dark Sky Places program, which is basically a certification program to recognize land management practices where you're putting responsible lighting in place. No, IDA does not believe in, we believe in a dark sky, it doesn't mean you have to have a dark ground necessarily. So there are now 135 International Dark Sky Places in 20 countries protecting almost we're almost going to hit 100,000 square kilometers. I mean, that's either a big number or a little number, depending on what you're looking at. But the news is awareness is growing. We actually certified, I think, 28 new places 
last year, and this is happening around the world. And these are places that are both being protected for, for their, the work they're doing to manage responsible lighting, but they're also bringing a new generation of people out under a dark sky, often to experience it for the first time. Uh, this is me actually uh, enjoying a dark sky out in New Zealand at the Aotai uh, uh, Dark Sky Sanctuary, about 80 kilometers north of Auckland, a remarkable place where two individuals have set up a great local business with an eight-inch Dobsonian, bringing people out to experience the Magellanic Clouds often for the first time. And you can see that's a transformative experience for these individuals. So you can imagine everyone's surprise <laughs> when this is what people started seeing in the sky in May of this year. And, and I think the surprise, well, at first it was the wonder, my goodness, what is that? Is it a UFO? What's happening here? And then people started to realize really what was going on. And I think a couple things like, okay, what's the magnitude of this? We're seeing f plans for 40, hundreds of thousands of these potentially. The other is most actions to address light pollution to date have been local actions. It's been cities and communities coming together to address it in their community, talking neighbor to neighbor, talking to their elected officials, and people feel like they can handle that. This felt so far outside everyone's reach. There's a company in California operated by this incredible genius who's changing the world in, in, in many ways, but it's so remote in a regulatory environment that is um, lacking, shall we say. So people felt powerless. So who is our community? You know, into the IDAs, in, when we think about our dark sky community, I mean, it definitely includes the professional astronomers, it includes the amateur astronomers. The astrophotography community is growing. That's one of the real hot topics in this field at this moment. Astrophotography and actually astrotourism are areas that are trending. If you talk to the National Park Service, their most liked uh, posts on Instagram are always about dark sky places and photos of the stars. And it's this combination of people's yearning for these special places, and to be honest, technology. Technology is catching up, enabling amateurs to do that. But it's also our members and advocates, and ultimately the people who go out and enjoy these dark sky places. That's really the people whose voices we want to make sure are represented in this conversation. We reached out to our community recently um, to ask them, is this of concern to you? Um, we got back about 91 responses in short order. It went out just, just over the Christmas break. And of those, I think one individual said, we love it, this is great. Four said, no, I don't think it's really gonna bother me. The overwhelming majority of those said, yes, we're deeply concerned. We don't know what the full impact is, but it's clear it's gonna impact us personally on some level. And the overwhelming response that we got was, was, was less about it's going to impact my ability to do astronomy or unlock the wonders of the universe, although clearly there was an element of this. It was really, it's going to fundamentally, it risks changing our relationship to the world and to the universe. I mean, that photo that Jeff shared of deep Simon space, when you start to understand that and you start to appreciate that and you're just out under the star like that, there's, there's this connection that happens with the magnitude of nature that we are so disconnected from. People are more and more disconnected from the natural world. One of the places that people are finding that connection now is out under a dark sky. And so we're thinking about the future here. Is the future a world where every time you're out under a dark sky, it's gonna be mediated by this false ceiling, this false canopy of eight, nine, 20, 100, whatever it is, number of moving artificial stars. Now, yes, in the middle of the night, that might be invisible. They're still up there, but they're not visible because they're not glinting light. But the reality is most people are not out under the stars in the middle of the night. If they're out at all, they're out there with their family as day turns to night, or maybe they're out there in the morning as, as night turns to day. And those are really critical times for our community. So we've been thinking about this in terms of what are a set of principles that we could start to move towards to make sure that we can allow these companies to continue to bring this incredible gift to the world, which is this gift of kind of connectivity. Well, why should it just be for the rich people in Silicon Valley? No, but it's, it's an element of democratization there. And it's not lost on us, I think, that we use technology and satellites every day Certainly in the light pollution world, our, our famous image is the one that's taken from the satellite looking down at the Earth. So we acknowledge that there's a role for these, but let's do them in a way that enables us to continue to enjoy that, that, that sky. 
And so really, I think it's really the, the threshold, the floors are like concentric rings. You know, solving for the LSST is clearly extremely challenging. Um, quiet enjoyment of the night sky for everyone is a challenging problem because it deals with nine billion people in every place in the planet, but the thresholds may be a little bit different. What might that look like? You know, the maintained brightness, we believe, should be below a threshold for the unaided eye. We believe that the visibility of these satellites should be the unusual occurrence. It should still spark that sense of wonder as opposed to be the routine. Uh, we are grateful that SpaceX, certainly to date, has been fairly open and transparent as to their launch and orbital parameters. They're clearly one actor amongst many coming. We hope the whole industry embraces that approach. Uh, and finally, is just this industry commitment to the shared stewardship of the Starfield night sky. The night sky is the ultimate public good. It's our ultimate commons. No one individual can protect it, and the flip side, I believe no one individual should be allowed to despoil that. So I wanted to actually just close by, um, you know, Vera Rubin, I know, has been a, a topic of conversation over the, the last few days with a, the naming of the LSST uh, for her and all her remarkable achievements. She gave a presentation at the 2007 IDA annual conference um, in DC a number, uh, back in 2007. And the story that was um, one of our board members just shared with me by email said as she shared that, she, you know, no one is born an astronomer. <laughs> Everyone is made an astronomer. And the spark for her was looking outside her window and seeing the stars above. So thank you. Okay, so what do I have to do here? Just get out of this. Press the big silver button. Okay, yeah. Right. I'm launching, just like SpaceX. Okay, so I'm the radio astronomer in the LPRISD, the radio, radio uh, interference. I don't want to steal the limelight um, from the interaction of optical astronomy and SpaceX. Uh, this is an aha moment, you know, a special moment in time, actually, for optical astronomy. Whereas for radio astronomy, you can view it pretty much as one in a, a very long series dating back to <coughs> the 70s of interactions of uh, the satellite industry and, and radio astronomy. Um, you know, there are, there are huge differences between the way the optical and the radio spectra are treated, most, is, most because the, the radio spectrum is very thinly sliced and very strongly regulated in, in a process called spectrum management, which, which at first to a physicist is, is a real oxymoron or something crazy, right? How do you manage the spectrum? The spectrum exists. You, you just imprint waves on it. But in fact, uh, radio astronomers have been involved with the processes of spectrum management since the 50s, okay? Uh, in 1957, 1958, and 1960, NRAO and the National Radio Quiet Zone were created in the United States. That was a precedent-setting thing. Now, now there are probably 15 or 20 radio quiet zones in the world, and I don't think one would uh, expect to be able to build a new large instrument without sighting it inside a radio quiet zone, if possible. Um, in 1960, IUCAF was created to gain protection for the 21 centimeter line, okay, at, war, at the World Administrative Radio Conference-59. And this was the first so-called passive science band, a band dedicated only to use by passive listening, uh, observer, observing observational sciences, including remote sensing. That, that are now vitally important for climate science and the study of, of Earth, of the Earth and how its environment is changing. So with that background, we've been interacting with satellites uh, since the 70s in, in not, not very good ways, okay? So we had our aha moments, I'd say, in, this, in the 70s and early 80s, uh, again in 1998 and 2004. First when GPS and GLONASS launched, Next went Iridium, and finally, when we began to be aware of the presence in the sky of radars, very high-powered radars, any one of which can burn out a radio astronomy receiver if, if, one, if a radio telescope were to be looking at it when that thing was, was looking, pointing at the radio telescope. So here's an example. 
Um, this is GLONASS, right, the Russian, deep, the Russian uh, Radio Navigation Satellite System Service, in 1992, eight years after the first GLONASS was launched, and the, the spike in the middle is what they actually need to operate, right, the broad thing of 10 or 1500, 10 or 15 megahertz across. But the broad thing extending over almost 200 megahertz was what they were actually spewing into the spectrum because they hadn't bothered to filter their receivers. And at this time, uh, GPS was only behaving a little bit better because they too had spectra that looked like this, okay? Um, it took until 2007 before GLONASS and GPS were held at the ITUR to be compliant with the, with the needs for protection of the radio astronomy spectrum for radio astronomy's needs, okay? So you had first launches in 1978 and 1984, and it wasn't until 2007 or actually a little later that these satellites cleaned up their act. Now, another example, for instance, is the mobile satellite system of Iridium, uh, which was launched in 1998, and as soon as it was launched in 1998, tests at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory showed within a radio astronomy band this nasty, ugly thing up top, and those spikes that are, that are shown there in black are seventh and fifth order intermodulation products of the unfiltered iridium transmitters. The amplifiers were being overdriven, and this, this caused the intermodulation distortion that appeared in the radio astronomy band. This was 1998. The lowest trace is, is 2019. Iridium recently failed a series of tests um, at a German monitoring station, and the test conditions proved so onerous to them that they simply abandoned uh, their attempts to protect radio astronomy. And as far as we can tell, they're broadcasting at 20 dB above levels that, that we need for protection. So this is a case that's been going on for you know, well over 20 years. The second generation of satellites has launched. The FCC has demanded that they, uh, that they operate RFI free. Very nice, very nice thing for us. It's now incumbent on NRIO to bring this to FCC's attention and see how we can deal with it. Um, radars. So there's a CloudSat 94 gigahertz radar. Now you're pointing when it's in control, uh, wildly gyrating when it has a battery problem. Um, this, is, this is a radar that's very valuable for climate science. It, it monitors it, it studies the, uh, the profile of clouds in the atmosphere. It, it measures the depths at which the, the clouds appear. It, it has an evil twin that's mounted on a truck and called an active denial system and was used in the early stages of the Iraq war for crowd control before I think, I think they realized that it was not a very humane way to, but it, it has been experimented on. I've talked to people in Tucson at, at the company that's developing it who have actually tried to stand in front of it. Apparently, you can't, you can't stand in front of it uh, for more than 10 or 15 seconds before your, your eyes begin to burn, no matter where your head is pointed. Okay, but it's basically the CloudSat radar mounted on a truck and described as an active denial system. Um, this radar, when it passes overhead at a radio observatory, saturates the radio astronomy receiver, no matter where the radio telescope is pointed. Okay, so in reaction to CloudSat, we, we implemented uh, alarms at our telescopes, and for those moving telescopes that needed access to the zenith to be transported, we had to put baffles on them. So all of the 60 or so 12-meter antennas at, at ALMA were outfitted with baffles so that when they were being transported and pointing straight up, if CloudSat happened to pass by, they would, their receivers would not be destroyed while they, were, while they were being moved, given that they had the point at the zenith and the possibility existed that, that CloudSat would pass so near the zenith that it would burn the receivers out. Um, there are many other of, of these radars at different frequencies. Now, this is a new development that we're going to have to come to grips with. Um, there is a band allocated between 9.2 and 10.4 gigahertz. This is roughly an order of magnitude lower frequency. Than, than you saw for CloudSat. Um, and these are being developed commercially now. And if you look on the right, you'll see ISI. ISI's slogan is every square meter, every hour. Okay, uh, a synthetic aperture radar like this, if pointed at a radio telescope, when the telescope is pointed in its direction, will burn out the radio astronomy receiver. As a matter of fact, some of these radars are so strong that even the ground scatter, the albedo of the ground is about 10%. And even this, the backscatter 
from the radar will burn out a radio astronomy receiver. So, you know, welcome to my world. These are the things that we've been dealing with, and we've now been dealing with them for quite a long time. Um, there is an ITUR recommendation, which is a best practice that is mandatory in some cases, that tells these operators of these radars not to illuminate radio astronomy sites without advance notice. Um, and I'm in contact with the operators, but it's a new concept to them that there will be square meters on the Earth that they will be trying to avoid. So the, the conversation is only beginning, I'd say. It's not even in this, this, this stage where optical astronomers are talking to SpaceX. Now, um, the last thing that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to skip the large part of this talk because for various reasons, is, is uh, mobile satellite service. This is... Now, I, I called it MSS. It should be FSS. It should be the fixed satellite service. This is my mistake. But Starlink and OneWeb were required to coordinate with radio astronomy, and they came to NRAO, sorry, they, they came to NRAO almost four years ago, uh, first OneWeb and then SpaceX, because there's a footnote to the U.S. Table of Frequency Allocations, U.S. 131, that requires operators using the band that SpaceX is going to use for its downlink between 10.7 and 12.75 gigahertz to coordinate with radio astronomy to protect the band at 10.6 to 10.7 gigahertz, which is also subject to, to the radars that I just showed you about in the previous slide. So this, this band is actually being clobbered on one side from the radio and clobbered from the other by, by, by OneWeb and Starlink. But the negotiations began four years ago because there is a, a strict regime of regulation and compliance in place for the radio spectrum. There were criteria that could be shown to SpaceX and OneWeb, which if they satisfied them, would constitute a mutual agreement with radio astronomy to operate. And SpaceX and OneWeb have modeled compliance and it has required them to forego the use of the lowest 250 megahertz channel, which is one eighth of their allocation. Okay? So they had to do this. There's no other way to meet the requirements. But it, it was a substantial concession on their part. Well, compliance depends on knowing things that don't always work as predicted on orbit. That's one of the problems why Iridium is generating as much interference as it is with the new constellation. Things are not working, they claim, as predicted. So we hope that these things are going to work as predicted, but in any case, we will continue to be talking to SpaceX. Now, I'm, I'm going to uh, ally the last part of the talk, which is something else, but the point is that scientific access to the radio spectrum is eroding, and it's eroding for several reasons. One is the increased commercialization of the radio spectrum. It's just being more used. The allocations have already, have always existed but now, for the first time, systems are going to come into existence that actually use them. And so we're going to find more of the spectrum crowded, and more of the spectrum crowded with very high-level signals. And these very high-level, very rapidly varying signals are going to be found in our passbands at the same time that we're trying to look for cleaner spectrum to use for our measurements. So there are a variety of conditions that we are going to have to rise to to operate safely in this new environment. But in general, the one thing that I want to say is that right now, science does not have an equal place at the table. The high-level advocacy for a position of science in use of the radio spectrum that we need is really not there. We have people working diligently at NSF and IUCAF and at ITUR to protect the, the existing resources. But in fact, in the face of what's happening now, we're going to need a higher level of advocacy for the, for the protection of scientific use of the radio spectrum. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're going to start with questions here in the room. If you're on the text, uh, sorry, if you're on the webcast, please queue up questions via text chat, and we'll get to you in a few minutes. Uh, remember to wait for the mic. Dave Finley from NRAO is going to bring a mic around. Uh, when you get it, identify yourself and tell us who you write for. So we'll start with Jeff, and then we'll do Fraser, and then we'll come over to Ethan. 
All right, Jeff Faust of Space News. Question for uh, Jeff Hall. I wonder if you can talk in a little bit more detail about the nature of the discussions between the AAS committee and SpaceX you've had over the last several months. What you've talked about, has, has the company been cooperative, understanding, have they need to be controlled mm -hmm. in, into to working on this? And then also, have you had similar discussions with other mega constellation companies like OneWeb, Telesat, Amazon, and so on? Okay, let's see. Oh, I am on. Okay. Um, so we have not had to cajole SpaceX in any way. They've been uh, very receptive, um, very proactive in holding roughly monthly telecons with us. You know, the, the first set of telecons has really been a discussion about understanding what they plan to deploy, when, at what altitudes, which gives us the information, or principally Pat, who's been doing the heavy lifting on all this, the information we need to, to come up with some of the numbers that he's presented for you. Um, I think while we've been working that out, we've it's been a little more staying in touch than making a lot of progress on mitigation, as you as you saw, the, the first darkened satellite only went up with the most recent launch. Um, we do have a telecon scheduled with OneWeb within the next couple of weeks. I forget the exact day, but we are making uh, uh, overtures to the other companies as well, because clearly SpaceX is not the only player in the, in the field. Okay, so Fraser behind you, and we'll come back. To, we're gonna go uh, to Ethan next and then Jay. Fraser Kane from Universe Today. Uh, can you give, give us any more details about the darkening process that's being done with the Starlinks? And with the new launch, has there been any chance to watch the string of pearls and see what impact that's already had? Um, answer to the last question, not yet, um, since we've all been here and consumed at the meeting. Um, but I don't know the, the details of exactly what they did to darken the satellite. Um, so I, I don't have any information on that. And I would say that we won't know until the end of February when that satellite reaches the operational orbit of 550 and is in its standard attitude configuration, then serious measurements can begin. Hi, uh, Ethan Siegel from Starts With a Bang, and I apologize for this question because I'm having difficulty controlling my fury at this situation. Why should astronomers trust SpaceX, which knows about this problem, but is deliberately worsening this instead of addressing it before additional launches, instead of seeking a legal or international mandate for regulation? Are we Elon Musk's Neville Chamberlain? Um, so the launches are underway right now. I think um, regulation of the Wild West up there is necessary. That is going to take a great deal of time to implement just because of the nature of that beast. Um, therefore, there is no advantage or upside to distrusting what SpaceX colleagues have told us. We will simply take them at face value and work as best as we can and honestly with them to try to solve the situation. They are on the record saying they want to solve the situation for astronomy. We are working to identify the targets they will need to hit to make that happen, and then we'll see what happens. Anybody want to? No, I, I think that's a fair assessment. What, what surprised everyone, the astronomy community and SpaceX, was how bright their satellites are. Uh, even at fifth magnitude. I mean, we knew these tens of thousands of mega constellations were coming, but um, based on the sizes and shapes of things currently in orbit, I thought maybe eighth or ninth magnitude. We were not expecting second or third magnitude in the parking orbits, and we certainly were not expecting fourth to fifth magnitudes in the deployment orbits. Okay, so uh, Jay Pasikoff here, and then we'll go to the back, and then we'll come over here. <clears throat> Jay Pasikoff, textbook author. Could somebody please tell me why Elon Musk thinks that he needs 10,000 satellites and apparently these other companies will launch other tens of satellites? I, I, as an astronomer, I appreciate all the problems, but, but what's, what is the supposed advantage? And then my second question has to do with international regulation. I haven't heard the UN mentioned. Uh, and radio it has some regulation, but is there, uh, we're not allowed to pollute the streams with, with uh, effluent, and, and, uh, and is there any hope of some regulation in the United States, for example, about polluting the sky with light? 
sure, why not? Um, <laughs> um, so I, I think that goes back to the, the, the answer uh, just uh, to Mr. Siegel. Uh, it's going to take time to implement this. Um, international regulations have been discussed, but the launches are proceeding right now. Um, so I think by the time anything like that is in place, we will be well down into the deployment phase of very large numbers of satellites. So we have to work with them now to try to solve the problem, and they've explicitly said they want to do that. Um, it is probably worthwhile to talk about the AAS, SpaceX, um, the United States, perhaps to take the lead. Um, but you know, space covers the entire Earth. You know, we, we can say what we want, but it is an international problem, and you will have to have international regulations that are agreed to, and that's where international agencies come into play, and that is a long and drawn-out process. We are having to react now in the most sensible way we think we can. And that, that I don't have all the details on that, but that appears to be, the number of satellites appears to be a function of both continuous service as well as uh, depending on the level of demand that they are seeing to serve the appropriate bandwidth. And as I understand from them this week, they're not sure what that number is yet. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> you say you need that many to have service. Is that service for my cell phone? So that I can use it? No. no. This is a system. There, you will have a, a box in your house around the size of a, a, a pizza box connected to uh, an antenna that actually needs to electrically steer itself to point these things because they move so fast. At, at 10 gigahertz, you know, your, your phone, when it works at, at low frequencies, has a very high area in an isotropic radiator. But that area of values is lambda squared. So at 10 gigahertz, the area of an isotropic radiator is 100 times smaller than, say, for an iridium phone, okay? And so you can't package something that will receive one of these satellites in something that you can carry in your pocket, okay? This, this, is, a, this is a kind of installation where you're going to have a pizza-sized box somewhere in your house with electronics in it, maybe connected to an antenna on your roof or somewhere that's going to electronically steer itself because it needs to point at a large number of very fast-moving satellites. And I, I should say that the cost of these Earth stations is not, these Earth stations don't yet exist in quantities that would make them affordable for broadband service for an ordinary house. This is, a, this is an active uh, field of development. Okay? You can't move these things mechanically. They have to be electrically beam steered. By the way, why don't you guys leave, leave your mics on okay. and then we'll control them from the back. Okay, so back corner here. Aaron Tovo for Astrobytes. My first question is directed at Dr. Seitzer. So you said that mitigating the issue and bringing the brightness of these objects down to fifth magnitude, I think in your words you said, is possible with you know simple mitigation. But the question is, what are the sat actual saturation limit for telescopes like LSST? Um, you know, just because they bring it down below the visual magnitude doesn't solve a lot of the problems that you've No, you're, you're absolutely right. It, the, the simplest or the first threshold or the first goal is to get them below naked eye visibility. And that, achieve, that appears doable, at least in our, in our discussions. The second threshold is to get them below saturation effects on these large telescopes. And I don't have the numbers for me. Uh, that's something Tony Tyson could help you with. And that's the second threshold. Um, you know, one of the issues is that every astronomy project does something different and is, has a different set of thresholds. So we're, we're trying to collect that information together, and Jeff can talk about the survey that was done. Thanks. And my second question is for Dr. List. Was the first few launches of uh, Starlink in compliance with US-131? Well, they're not operating yet, so we don't know. Until they actually start operating and broadcasting and, and transmitting their traffic, you can't really do a test of the system. Okay, Pamela? I, I greatly appreciate the use of existential crisis as a way of, dis of discussing this early on and, and Patrick's nuanced approach to first order of business is to make these things fainter. 
One of the things that I haven't heard addressed that I think as a field we need to figure out how to address, especially after what we've learned from TMT, is currently, according to research by folks like Dr. Phil Metzger, it's satellite systems like this are the only way to get global low-cost internet out in the next few decades. How do we argue to save the skies but not allow low-cost internet to be an option to remote places? How do we have that nuanced discussion of this is the only way currently seen to overcome the di digital divide? I, I wouldn't know where, where to start. It, it's clearly the simplest way, and that, that means that you want a large number of satellites at low altitude so that you have low latency. Uh, if you have low latency, low delay, that means you need large numbers of satellites to have a continuous coverage. And, you know, this means you, you don't have to, I, I think the economics of this have not worked out yet. There have been several companies that have gone under already. Uh, the Iridium example was when Iridium was launched, there were several companies that jumped into the band, on the bandwagon, and they never went anywhere. Um, it, that's, you know, praying for failure is uh, probably not an option that the astronomical community should uh, rely on. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see um, how this works out. Um, and I, I really don't have an answer to your question. I, I think all we can do at this point, we have to move <coughs> rapidly, as Jeff has said. We just can't wait for the regulatory environment, is to convince SpaceX that it's in their best interest to move rapidly and solve this problem quickly and set the standard for everybody else. Uh, can I just add, I mean, I, I think we, we just need to move away from positioning this against the sort of, particularly the professional astronomy community, which is like a handful of large telescopes versus the rest of the world. And, and really that's, I think, part of what we're trying to do is broaden this. So there are these cultural and heritage values associated with the sky that, many, that resonate with many people. And, and then appealing to the spirit of innovation and technological development and the rapid development cycle, say, look, we can have these two things together. Um, if, you know, if, 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 again, if we can clearly articulate what the design parameters are, kind of what, what the outcome goal uh, we're seeking for. Uh, and then again, I think many of us, I think probably almost less concerned about SpaceX than all of the other actors that are coming into the field after them. And ultimately, I think the only piece that we've got on our side, in a sense, is the court of public opinion in this one. And if, again, if it's presented as an, in, an either or, um, we've got to move together, say, no, we, we need to come up with a way that we can have, bring this social good to the world in a way through technology innovation that protects the heritage of dark skies around the world. Okay, Henry? Um, there's a Pacific Telecom Conference coming up in a few weeks here in Hawaii, annual one. And I was wondering if astronomers have a place at the Telecom Conference, because they're talking about 5G, they're talking about latency, they're talking about having all these satellites in place to handle things like electric vehicles and cell phone services around the world. So it seems there's a natural sort of connection between telecom and um, astronomy that hasn't yet <laughs> been appeared. <clears throat> it, it, it's working. It's working under the hood to the extent that it exists. I mean, um, <coughs> what I mean is that all of these users of the electromagnetic spectrum, 5G is one of them, are 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 compelled to to observe the rules and the regulations. Okay, um, to some extent, they're being defined as we as we speak. Because, for instance, at the world radio conference that just took place in Sharm El Sheikh, and there were a couple of people, there were two people in this room who spent a month there, okay? Um, some of the rules for 5G were, were rewritten there, okay? Um, and indeed, the rules are written to suit the convenience in many cases of the 5G operators, okay? They have, they have a lot of influence on what happens. So for instance, the, the unwanted emissions limits that spew into adjacent spectrum from 5G equipment, you know, the stuff that spews out from the sides of where they actually should be operating, um, they played a large role in setting the limits at the last work at, at values that were much higher than we really needed, okay? So the answer is things don't always work out the way we want, but there is a process in, there is a process in place, and it's happening all the time. 
All of these 5G operators are continuously involved both at, at the FCC and at the ITUR, the International Telecommunications Union, and it's a process of negotiations. The point is that no use is actually allowed to be made of the spectrum unless it can be shown to be compatible with other uses. Every time you want to put a new use into the radio spectrum, you've got to show at some level that it's compatible or can be made compatible or that conditions can be adjusted to, to fit it in. Things don't happen willy-nilly, okay? And this is going on all the time. It's a, it requires a lot of work. There were thousands of people involved in spectrum management. We spent a month, 3,500 people, in Sharm el-Sheikh, okay? The U.S. delegation had 250 people on it. Japan had 100. France had 100. And this is all going on all the time, trying to make everything fit into the radio, into the electromagnetic spectrum. So when there's a meeting of the industry talking to itself, you shouldn't really expect, well, b believe me, there will, there will be on the agenda of that uh, discussions of how to make their applications compatible, okay? But the place of the radio astronomy community within that, um, we don't need to be there. Okay? They're fully aware of the <clears throat> obligations and they're fully aware of the processes that, that they need to undergo. And I, I would just add to that that this is a, the start of educating the rest of the satellite community of the importance of brightness and uh, taking care or considering brightness in the design and operation of their satellites. And that process is just starting and we're looking forward to going to professional conferences and, and giving presentations there. And I would add, in fact, we discussed that a bit this week with the representatives from SpaceX who are here. We've had, you know, several teleconferences, but we have not been, you know, at the satellite conferences. But that came up as did possibly a more extended workshop between astronomy and SpaceX to start hashing out some of these details a little more comprehensively than you can do over the phone. So these things are in the works. Yeah, I mean, if there's something new that you know the industry isn't aware of, it, it would pay you to go there to an industry convention. But in the case of the radio spectrum, everybody is very aware of, of what's going on. Dirk Lorenzen, German Public Radio. Oh, oh that's... Sorry, it's on? Dirk, okay. Dirk Lorenzen, German Public Radio. Of course, the radio astronomy will be affected all day long, but did you calculate in the optical range how many dark hours, for instance, you will get at the LSST site because the satellite... Uh, the y scale? Yes, we did, and that's a very much a function of the time of year. This was in my presentation this morning. I'm happy to provide you the full presentation, which, which shows the plots and the red lines uh, that are crossed. It depends very much on altitude, inclination, and the time of year. So for example, we hear that you should launch the satellites into higher altitudes because they'll be fainter. The trade-off there is that they will be visible longer into the middle of the night. So you know, my personal preference, and the disclaimer is I do not speak for LSST or anyone else, would be to limit the damage to as short a time as possible. Um, for astronomers, the interesting thing is for these streaks that cross the field of view, the, the additional factor that goes in is the angular velocity because it's the time it takes the satellite to cross a pixel in your detector array. And that goes up as uh, the, the angular velocity goes down as you go to higher orbits. So in fact, you don't gain the full factor of four if you doubled the distance. You only gain a factor of 2.8. And so, you know, we need to, this is one of the education things that we're going through and trying to educate the industry on. Did I answer your question? <laughs> okay, but I can share those plots with people. Do we have any uh, questions from the webcast? Yes, we have five. Oh, well, let's take some of those. <laughs> All right, the first question comes from Jonathan Amos of the BBC in London, and it's directed at the panel. Can you say something about the impact of the OneWeb satellites? There are six up there now, but they are a different design. Are they less bright? I'll, I'll take, this is Pat Seitzer, I'll take the answer on that. The current measurements that we have are that they are eighth magnitude, uh, and they are thus below the naked eye limit. So they are not an issue for seeing them um, at, uh, you know, at star parties and the like. They are, however, an issue for um, large telescopes, and we'll have to model that precisely. They're at 1,200 kilometers. They'll be visible all night long and during the summers in Chile or the summers in the Northern Hemisphere for large telescopes. 
Okay, uh, next question comes from Eric Mack of CNET, and it's also directed at the panel in the context of optical astronomy. We've heard from both astronomers and SpaceX that this problem came as a surprise, but I've heard from some scientists that that's not true and the concerns go back many years. So the question is whether this concer these concerns are new and surprising. Uh, this is Pat Seitzer again. You know, the large photographic surveys of the sky basically came to an end in the early 90s because it was impossible to take you know, a huge image of the sky, deep exposure for many tens of minutes without having at least one or more satellite trails in them. Those, so we knew this problem was coming. What was, what was totally surprising was how bright the Starlinks were. You know, we thought if they were ninth or 10th, I, we, can, we can live with that. But third magnitude, fifth magnitude, that's, that's far brighter than we had any reason to expect, and it turns out SpaceX hadn't expected them to be that bright. So yes, the, we, we should have been aware of that, but there are many, many objects in Earth orbit that uh, are similar sizes, rocket bodies, defunct satellites at anywhere from 400 to 1,200 kilometers that are much fainter. And what is really surprising about the SpaceX satellites is how bright they are. Uh, next question comes from Daniel Fisher of Skyweek Germany. It's directed at Jeff or Pat. When you quote unquote paint it black, doesn't that increase the infrared signature of a satellite, causing new problems in the near or thermal infrared? It certainly does. <laughs> <laughs> no free lunch, I mean, huh? So the answer is yes. And you know, this is one uh, uh, point we've been uh, in, in the whole education continuum we've been getting across or trying to get across to SpaceX you know understandably they'd like to have targets that that they hit and and we've tried to point out this is not simply a matter of providing them a visual magnitude because there are all these interlocking effects if you do one thing you're going to exacerbate something in another in another area so it's uh, just figuring out what metrics to hand them is not a trivial problem Okay, uh, next from Erica Carlson of Astronomy and Discover Magazines. Uh, I have a clarifying question and follow up for probably Dr. Seitzer. Is it the large field of view or the detector sensitivity or both that makes the LSST especially vulnerable to satellite mega constellations? What other facilities will be especially vulnerable? Uh, it is the large field of view and the sensitivity and the short exposures and the rapid, the fact that it will cover the whole southern sky every few nights. All of those factors make this a, make the LSST really the driving force for controlling it. There, one of the things we are learning from the survey that we sent out is what other facilities and things will be affected by this. Uh, there are large uh, surveys like DESI on the 4-meter, which in, in at Kitt Peak, which is a spectroscopic survey, um, which will, could, in principle, be affected by these things as well. Did okay. you want to add anything? Yep. No, it's, it's just a very strong function of the type of science the facility is carrying out. So if you are doing point source <laughs> spectroscopy, uh, you know, if something crosses right through your source, that is, very high impact, but very low probability. Um, but there are many uh, observatories that fall more in the high impact, high probability quadrant of the, 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 the impact plane uh, that, 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 are, that are the real tall poles for, for being impacted by Starlink. Uh, the last question comes from Larry Marshall, freelancer associated with Gettysburg College. It's directed at Pat or anyone. <laughs> Is there an estimate about how many false transits and eclipses there will be when these are fully deployed. Is there an estimate of how many false transits and eclipses there will be? So what we're talking about is the satellite crossing in front of a star and mimicking a, uh, a planet or something. And I'd say at this point, we don't have that information. I think at low Earth orbit, and this is just the rough back of the Earth, or back of the envelope calculation, uh, there was a slip, um, that at low Earth orbit, because the velocities are so high, the angular velocities of low Earth orbit satellites are so high that it's not likely to be an issue. 
but those numbers and those studies have to be done, and they have not been done today. Is that it? That, yeah, that's it. Okay, well, we do have to wrap up because it's uh, a few minutes after uh, 3.15. So I want to thank our panelists for their willingness to come up here and share their expertise with us today. I want to thank uh, all the journalists and public information officers and others who registered as press who came to Honolulu for this uh, fabulous week of astronomy. Uh, I want to announce the uh, date and time of the next press conference. It will be on uh, Monday morning, June 1st, 2020 in Madison, Wisconsin uh, at 10.15 a.m. Uh, Central Time, I think. Are they on Central Time in Madison? Central Daylight Time, yeah, because it's June. All right. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, we have... Thank you, for holding you can thank me for holding all these press conferences. <laughs> It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. All right, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your time in Hawaii.